New Super Mario Bros. Wii introduced many pieces of music. Some are energetic and catchy, while others are more subdued and poetic. But none can compare to the sheer epicness and raw emotion put forth by the castle music. Between the instrumentation, chord progression, and harmonies, this song truly stands out among the music of the Super Mario Bros. franchise. In this video, we will examine this song to see how it accomplishes this feat. Credit for the sheet music I used to analyze this score goes to Zio Migros on MuseScore. First, a bit of information about this song. This song is in 4-4 time, which means there are 4 beats per measure, and a quarter note gets 1 beat. As for the key, I'll get to that a bit later, as it's a rather interesting story. It operates at a pretty smooth 127 beats per minute, which is just long enough for you to feel the emotion of every chord. The instruments in it are organ, synth pad, violas, cellos, contrabasses, tubas, timpani, glockenspiel, snare, cymbal, and gong. To me, there are three sections of this song. The first has the intro and is somewhat wild regarding its key. The second is sort of the main body of the song, and the third presents an air of finality, and also has the short outro that leads to the loop of the song. The first part begins with a short percussion-focused intro between snare and timpani, with a gong sounding long and loud at the beginning. The timpani alternates between E and A, somewhat setting the root of the key to A. The snare continues through the rest of the song as the main driving energy from the percussion. The first full chord comes from the organ as it starts on a D note, then plays a glissando C-sharp diminished 7th. Defining a key for the following part of the song is... I. It's, I, I have no idea how to do it. It's really tricky. The timpani seems to suggest that the key has A as its root. Considering the key signature only has B-flat, it might be a Phrygian. However, this is contrary to the A major chord seen in this part. Well, what about A major as the key? Well, this section also has C minor and G major chords, which wouldn't fit the C-sharp and G-sharp seen in A major. It seems like the key basically changes every few measures. For the purposes of this explanation, however, I will be considering this section to be in A minor. The rest of the first section follows a four-measure pattern. There are two main chords. Let's call them chords X and Y. Chord X is minor and in the second inversion, while chord Y is a seven chord in the first inversion and is a whole step above chord X. In the first and second measures, chord X is played as a quarter note and chord Y is played as a dotted half note. In measure three, each chord is played as a quarter note as chords X, then Y, then X, then back to X, but in its first inversion instead. The final measure is one major chord as whole notes, and it's in the second inversion, a perfect fourth down from chord X. This pattern occurs twice. The first time chord X is D minor, chord Y is E7, and it ends on A major. The second time chord X is C minor, chord Y is D major, and it ends on G major. As for the bass line, which is played by timpani and contrabasses on 8th notes, during the first time it stays on A, and during the second time it goes C, D, E flat, and ends on G. Each minor chord presents a sense of fear, which is answered by the 7th chord's terror. Despite most of the time spent in the sections being on major chords, altogether it gives off a feeling of terrified awe, like facing a powerful, bloodthirsty beast. The ascending bass line in the second loop of the pattern helps to give a feeling of rising tension, all in perfect preparation for the second section. Fortunately, defining a key for the second and third sections is much easier than for the first. G Dorian. That is G minor, but with an E natural instead of E flat. Speaking of G minor, that is the first chord in this section, despite the previous one being a G major chord. What follows in, in the next four measures are an F sharp diminished seventh second inversion, a G minor second inversion, a C major first inversion, and a G minor second inversion. Within the progression, the F sharp diminished creates quite a feeling of tension, as is common in diminished chords, while the C major gives an upswing of hope. Each G minor chord serves to reset the auditory palette, so the chords don't trip over each other. Again, all of this is set over an ascending bass line. G, A, B flat, C, 
ending. Following the last G minor is an E diminished, A7 first inversion, and a D over a bass line of D flat, A, and D, ascending in a buildup at the end. The E diminished also comes in with great tension, while the A7 and D serve to transition to the next portion of the song, which loops back the previous eight measures in terms of chord progression. The melody being played here on a low cello helps keep it subdued and slightly difficult to discern, blending with the other parts around the same octave. This is an interesting choice, considering that the melody is usually supposed to be the most audible part of the song. The melody is also very flowy and lacks brief notes, with quarter notes being the shortest in that part. During the second pass of the chords, the organ, previously playing in short spurts and sometimes missing notes from the chords, now plays in full whole notes in every pitch seen in the chords. At the end, the violas play a short harmony part, which suggests a D suspended chord instead of D major. This brings us to the final of the three sections. Quite a bit has changed right off the bat. First, the tuba finally gets some notes in, essentially taking the organ's job of highlighting the chords. The organ, meanwhile, has moved on to rapid 16th note arpeggios. The glockenspiel also gets introduced, playing harmonic whole notes, while the timpani is cut out. Contrary to previous themes of ascension, the chords and bass line here follow a descending pattern. C minor, G minor, E diminished seventh, back to G minor, then C minor, G minor, then A major, and finally D major. The bass line is C, B flat, A, G, then C, B flat, A, and D. Starting with the C minor and G minor sets a precedent of despair, which is followed up by the harsh A diminished, then back to G minor to start again. After another C minor and G minor, the A major is sort of a surprise, like an unpleasant realization. Finally, the D major prepares us for the final portion of the piece, before the loop back to the start. While the other sections had a mix of emotions, most negative, some positive, some sour, these last four measures are downright repulsive. Despite coming from a D major, the first chord here is a D minor. This is unpleasant enough, but it is followed up by a chord with D, E, and A flat, and another with D, E flat, and G in the last two measures. I'm not sure exactly what the former is, but the latter might be an E flat major 7, just in the second or third inversions and without a B flat. Either way, the combination of these chords, while not discordant, is undeniably dissonant. These last three chords are played on a synth sound, with the melody now belonging to the glockenspiel. During the last measure, the organ plays its introductory glissando C sharp diminished seventh chord, which leads back to the beginning of the song. All in all, analyzing this piece of music was quite a journey. Personally, it gave me a greater appreciation for the diminished and diminished seven chords. It often experimented with notes and chords outside its key, and it certainly used them to great effect. If I were to recommend a remix of this song, it would be the one by Revamp It Orchestra, which I will link in the description. This piece of music is absolutely perfect for the feeling of traversing a lava-filled stone brick castle. Once again, the music truly captures the moment and draws you into the game.